Surely you've heard the phrase, like a fish in water. It implies a sense of belonging, feeling secure, recognized, able to participate in one's community. But what if your quest to belong is leading to your downfall? Let's get into it. Hello friends, welcome to the Unshackled Audio Drama Podcast, where we share the gospel of Jesus Christ through the art form of audio drama. <laughs> yes, and that includes sound effects. We do this by using true life stories of real people. I'm Timothy Gregory, and just a heads up, because of the subject matter of today's episode, parental guidance is suggested. Now, I have a question for you. What are you willing to think say, or even do, to belong. It's a strong impulse, belonging, and if you don't have a sense of belonging, you may even choose harmful things just to get it. Just like the man in this week's story. When something in life gives us community and security, it can be hard to let go of, especially when we're being taken away from the things we feel matter. But what if we have a distorted idea of what really matters? In that case, our need to belong can lead to a place of desperation or even danger. In other words, you could be digging your own grave. And Michael Matthews is going to show us what that looks like. Also, you want to stick around because later we are going to give the rest of you an opportunity to enter yet another sweepstakes drawing for a prize. No, it's not a cash prize, but... It is a prize, and I think it's a prize you are really going to like if we draw your name. But first, let's get to it, folks. Part one of the true story of Michael Matthews. I know this is for the best. You sure? Clint doesn't want custody, and there's no way I can start over with two little kids in tow. Oh, I get it. It's hard enough already. But turning over parental rights to me is a big deal. Clint and I discussed it. With the kids living with you, it makes sense. You have parental power to make decisions. But you're, you're still going to be involved, right? I mean, the kids need you. Of course. I'll visit as often as I can. <sighs> well... This way, the kids won't be juggled around, switching more schools. They'll have a stable home. Finally. It'll be good for them, I know. And I love having them around. So, you'll do it? Of course. I can't look the other way when my grandbabies need me. I'll miss them. <laughs> <laughs> I was only two when my mother signed over custody of me and my three-year-old sister, Sherry. Overnight, our grandparents became the leading figures in our lives. As much as we adore them, we were nothing but ecstatic when Mama came visiting. Come up here, Michael. I can't. Sure you can. I'll slide over. I want to show you this Bible. Its pictures are amazing. Who's that, Mama? That's Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. <laughs> That's silly. They got leaves for clothes. <laughs> oh, look here. Look at this picture. It's one of my favorites. Oh, look at the angel. It's Archangel Michael casting Satan out of heaven. This is who I named you after, Michael. Him? Yeah, he's powerful and loving and loyal. All things you are. Wow. We'll just let it ring. Oh, it's okay. I was expecting a call. Well, I can take a message for you. Just tell them I'm putting my things together and I'll be leaving soon. But you just got here last night. The kids have barely seen you. Oh, well, you understand, don't you? Mommy's life's in the city and I gotta go back. No, you can't go. You said we go to the fair tomorrow. <clears throat> when I say I need to go, I need to go. I'll be back in a few weeks. Mommy, don't go, don't go, don't go. Sherry. Oh, they're just too little to understand. <laughs> Can't say much that I do either. Oh, Mother, don't get like that. That's why the kids are set up here with you. You know I don't have time for mothering. The man in our story discovered that 
where you think you fit in isn't always where you're meant to be. This is part one of the true story of Michael Matthews, right now on Unshackled. Due to my mother reading, sharing me the Bible, I always believed and knew there was a God. But my knowledge of him was very limited. With as much as mother was away and as little as she'd pop in, I didn't develop much of a bond with her. My grandparents tended to keep to themselves, and there wasn't much interaction outside the family, which may have been why Sherry and I didn't develop close friendships at school. Where's your mittens? In the house. I'll get them. No, the bus is already in here. We're mine. But you'll get cold. I don't play much at recess anyway. I'll be fine. I wish we didn't even have recess. It's just one more thing I hate. Just keep your head down. Less chance of being teased. Is that what you do? Every day. Take the first seat open and no crying. Na 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 na. Na 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 na. Na 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 na. Na 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 na. Na 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 na. They're creepy and they're kooky, mysterious and spooky. It's Snake Man and Snake Sister, the Matthews family. Don't you have anything better to do? Uh, nope. I'm all yours today. Sad. What's sad is you living in that creepy rundown house. We live with our grandparents, you big jerk. And I heard your aunt is a witch. She is not. She hasn't been around in years. What's it matter? She is one. She even tried to get my aunt Laverne to join her in witchcraft. Just leave us be or I'll bloody your nose. Touchy, touchy, touchy. Must be the witch in you. The worst part of the kids' torturous teasing was being able to see their point. Besides our family's lack of socializing and living in a big old house, I had made the unfortunate mistake of bringing a pet snake for show and tell. While I barely knew Aunt Alma, it didn't stop rebukes for her witchcraft being passed down through generations. At least it all learned us a family theme song. Not all kids are serenaded every time they get on the bus. What am I, living with Alma again? Aw, oh, Grandma, you're ruining all the fun. Oh, I am, am I? How can I blast Sherry with the flashlight if you can't see the beam? <laughs> I am too old to get around in the dark. How can Alma do it? Maybe she's just not a witch. Maybe she's a vampire. Weirdo. Eek! That's so creepy. Now, kids, don't go creating gossip. Keep the facts straight. Auntie Alma is just a witch. <laughs> She's only married to a vampire. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Grandma. <laughs> Seriously, Grandma, why hasn't she gotten married? Well, maybe witches prefer to be old maids. But she's so nice. I know. But, Michael, you've got to understand her beliefs and lifestyle are risky and don't jive with many people. You mean Christians? Mm-hmm. Most folks don't think it's good to poke around in the dark arts, and it scares them. How so? They see it as a form of evil, and they're not to have anything to do with evil. So they wash their hands of it. Is that what happened to Aunt Alma? Yeah. Most everyone else in our family is too afraid of her. How come you still like her? <laughs> I love her. She's chosen how she wants to live and believe even if it's dangerous. And I've chosen to love her nevertheless. It was hard sometimes to know where Grandma stood on things. She didn't attend church or services of any kind. Her philosophy seemed to align more with live and let live. Maybe that way I didn't feel wrong for her to love her sister, which she did while she had her. Hello. Ma'am, this is Sheriff Dixon from Warren County. Are you a relative of a Miss Alma Matthews? Yeah. Yeah, that's my sister. So you're the closest next of kin. I am. Well, ma'am, there was a gas leak from her stove, and, uh, well, it caused an explosion. Oh, oh my. Oh, Alma. Oh uh, she, uh, yeah, she, uh, she didn't make it. Oh, 
Are you sure? Yes, ma'am. The firefighters are still going through what remains of the house. Uh, Would anyone else have been inside with her? Uh, no, I doubt it. Alma lived alone. She didn't accept visitors, and she was too afraid to even open the curtains. Well, that's uh, mighty private. Yeah, officer, are you certain it was a gas explosion? No, well, it was what we figured was the cause. Why? Well, could it have been something else, li li like a spell? Uh, but what are you saying? Well, Alma's she, a witch, or, or as she'd say, an occultist. <laughs> I'm just wondering if she did something wrong, like mixed a wrong potion or misphrased a spell she was casting. <laughs> oh, Ma'am, I've got to be honest. I, uh, I don't know anything about uh, well, those kinds of things. But... Oh, oh it, it, it's all right. I was just trying to make sense of things and thought perhaps... Well, maybe one of her friends or someone in her uh, community of belief could help you make sense of things. Ann Alma's death matched how she lived, questionable and mysterious. No one knew for sure what she did or how she died. It added to the woman's secrecy and aloofness and gave her a mystifying air quite unlike anything else I'd experienced. Even dead, she had a lure, and sometimes we all seem to feel it. Looky here, isn't it awesome? A witch hat? Yeah! Are you nuts? Why? Do you want the kids at school to have a field day with this? Actually, I think I might. What? They're always teasing us the way it is. We might as well spook the wits out of them on Halloween. What do you mean? Oh, I wish I knew a spell to cast. Abracadabra sounds so babyish. We could ask Grandma. Maybe Alma taught her something. I don't know if she'd tell us. And I don't want to make her sad thinking of her dead sister. Well... Maybe there's a book somewhere. At the library, you think? <laughs> no. The kids in movies find dusty old books in attics. We can start looking. You know, it wouldn't be a bad idea to know a few things. It'd be fun. And it'd teach the punks to pick on us, that no one messes with us and gets away with it. Why didn't we do this before? So, unfortunately, and stupidly, at the age of 13, I became a practitioner of the dark arts. By 16, I dropped out of school and built my reputation as someone not to be messed with. Bad things would come to those who crossed me or my family. I felt so empowered that I was eager to find out what else might be. Oh, man. You've got to quit sleeping on the couch. You know I get up early. I know. I just couldn't make it up the steps. You didn't even take off those dirty boots. I'll clean it up later. I can't believe Grandma isn't getting after you. She tried. What do you mean? I just told her it's a phase. And as sick as alcohol makes me, it's not my drug of choice. When you put it like that, it sounds like you're just going to find something else. Well, maybe I will. Just be careful. I still need a brother. It wasn't long before I discovered marijuana and with it the party scene. Some say it's a gateway into the drug scene. Those refute that. Well, they don't know very many druggies. Finally, I found a place to belong. Finally, you're here! All the girls have been asking if you're coming. I'm sorry, I had to go back for the cards. Great, we can do readings again. That's what I thought. You're amazing with numerology and readings, but your seances, man, they're... They're out of this world. It's always interesting to find out what spirit will connect to. It's beautiful, man. It really is. I'm just surprised how excited everyone gets. Yeah. You should have seen all the people who showed up. I didn't even invite. All because you're going to be here. Really? They love you, man. Wow. I didn't realize so many people were interested. Are you kidding? Magic fits perfect with the drugs. My interest in the dark arts grew well beyond what I could perform at parties. At home, I had a four foot by two foot plexiglass cage containing a slithering four foot long spectacled cobra. The top of its cage served as an altar for our own blood sacrifices and me and my friends. And as the popular phrase goes, the party was just getting started. You're never gonna believe what I got. If you blew all our money buying ditch weed again... This is worlds better than any marijuana. What is that? You bought us paper? No. 
It's acid, man. Folks, we'll get back to Michael's story in just a moment. But first, I want to share a bit about how our ministry is able to bring hope to people all over the world. Unshackled is now in its 71st year of spreading the good news through powerful stories about real people. Our success is a result of God's blessing and the involvement of, well, supporters like you. When you contribute to Unshackled, it has a direct impact. Your support allows us to hire quality writers, talented actors, as you can hear, a skilled production team, and a devoted staff. Through your support, we're able to share Unshackled worldwide. So, in order to continue the work of spreading the gospel and allowing us to offer this program for free, won't you consider making a donation to Unshackled? It's really quite easy. All you need to do is click on the live link, if there's one where you're listening, or visit our podcast website at unshackledpodcast.org. That's unshackledpodcast.org, and then click the donate button. Or you can always write a check, Unshackled, we take checks. You mail that check to 1458 South Canal Street, Chicago, Illinois, 60607. We thank you for your partnership in our ministry. And now, back to part one of the true story of Michael Matthews. I had never seen acid before, but its effect on me of contrived bliss deluded me into a false state of mental and spiritual enlightenment. More effective than meditating on a candle flame, it was so much more powerful than a mere recreational drug. Life felt like it was on the up and up. It was then that I met Darlene, and we were married shortly thereafter. Look what I got us. Oh, champagne? Happy second year anniversary. Happy second year anniversary. <laughs> <laughs> I've been waiting to tell you, there's more to celebrate. Are we gonna be house hunting? Sure we can, but the biggest news is, I'm ditching work at the store. <gasps> You're not stocking shelves anymore? Nope. What are you gonna do? The cash off those quarter pounds of weed I've been peddling is starting to add up. How much are you making? Three grand a week. What? Why didn't you tell me? I wasn't trying to keep it from you. I knew you always had pockets full of cash, but I didn't realize. I need to be dealing. <laughs> no, 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 no. I do enough for both of us. And having an ever-present supply to party with is an added bonus. I heard there's even bigger money in cocaine, but that... It's true. And I've been thinking about adding it to the inventory. Honey, think of it. Between the party and the disco scene... A middleman can make a big profit. Exactly. I'll, uh, go see a guy I know. We were living up life. Then Darlene went into labor the evening of my 25th birthday and Ethan Charles was added to our life. Look how small his hands are. Here, look at his toes. Oh, he's just perfect. Down to every last detail, isn't he? He is. This is going to change everything. I know. I can't wait to take him home. You know, this is going to change everything. You're not happy? I am. It's just a- What? It's just, I don't know. Of course, I'm happy. Tell me the truth. It, it feels like a radical change with all this responsibility forced on me. Forced on you? Becoming a father is a little more than you wanted, is it? It's not that I don't love him or want him. Of course I do. I, I just don't like feeling like I'm not getting to choose my own fate. You know what, Michael? You're more in love with yourself and your lifestyle and the drugs you're addicted to than your own wife and kid. That's not fair. You just don't want anyone interfering in what you see as your own trajectory. I shouldn't have said anything. As though you were going to hide all that? This should be one of the happiest days of our lives and you're ruining it with your own self-pity. I wanted to do things my own way on my own timetable and I resented whatever got in the way of that. Basically, I hadn't grown up yet. To be honest, Darlene was right. I was more in love with my life than I was concerned about loving her and baby Ethan. What they needed from me didn't even register in my mind. Okay, I got the car out front, and I can help carry the- We can't go yet. What's the matter? The doctor 
said Ethan's lungs aren't clear enough. He thinks he might have some kind of virus. What? A virus? I'm free to go, but we can't take him home. Oh, no. The visits back and forth would prove pure torture for us. Being a man, I felt pressure to be macho, so I kept everything inside. I kept packing my feelings, even as Ethan's condition deteriorated, and he was transferred to a children's hospital. Hello? Mrs. Matthews? Yes? This is Dr. Turner. Ma'am, you and your husband need to come down to the hospital. What's wrong? Has something happened? Ma'am, we've done everything we can for your baby, but he's... Uh unresponsive now, and we need to remove the ventilator. I just kept hoping. Well, we, we all did. Ethan's immune system is just too weak. Okay. We'll be down. He's gone, isn't he? Yes. Our sweet baby. <laughs> We've got to go down there. They need us to... I'm not, I'm not going. What? Go ahead if that's what you want to do, but I'm staying here. Michael, it's your son. I'm well aware of that. You'd have me go down there by myself while they take our baby off life support? So much for Mr. Tough Guy. I wasn't even strong enough to say goodbye to my own son. I just didn't think I could handle it. Oh, goodness! Michael, you startled me! Hey, sis. The car is gone. I thought no one was here. Darlene went down to the hospital. Well, I'll put this casserole in the fridge. Directions are on the top. Thanks, Sherry. How's the baby today? They're taking him off the ventilator. Wait. What? Darlene went down for it. Oh, I'm so sorry. I can't imagine. He made it 21 days. But what... what are you doing here? I didn't want to be there. And you think Darlene does? That was her decision. I made mine, she made hers. You think Darlene's going because she wants to watch her baby be removed from life support? She's down there because she loves that little baby. And she's going to be there for him no matter how painful it is. Maybe she's better at handling these things. Maybe her behavior isn't guided by what feels good to her. You think that's why? Why else are you still here? <laughs> Can you take me? Let's go. I'll get my jacket. All these years. All the sacrifices I made on this stupid altar. Where'd it get me? You got no power to do anything. You hear me? No power. God, I know I don't deal with you much, but I'm asking you to take Ethan in your arms and end his suffering. Wow, it's so busy. No one rests in the ICU. Must not. His room's down here. Do you want me to wait out? Michael, you came. Sorry I'm late. You're here. That's what matters. Are you okay? Oh, Darlene, I'm so sorry. It's so hard. I'm just glad he's not struggling anymore. I'll forever be grateful my sister showed up and talked me into going. Darlene had walked right into my arms because I was there to support her. I can't say I understood Ethan's death, but I wasn't angry and didn't want to blame God. Part of me believed, had my attitude been different, Ethan would have lived. It's been said, if God gives you a gift, and you refuse it, he'll take it back. And maybe that's exactly what he did with Ethan. My biggest problem was I didn't want to be any different. I was finally talking to God, but my rebellious lifestyle offered excitement and promised adventure, which only meant for me, 
things were going to get much worse. As we heard from Michael in part one of his story, when we feel like we don't belong, we can chase after dangerous things that will only fulfill us for a moment, but can ruin us for a lifetime. Friend, the ultimate place to belong is in the family of God. The Bible says in John chapter 1, verse 12, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Have you believed on the name of Jesus Christ? If you do, he will give you a sense of belonging that far exceeds anything you could ever imagine, an eternity with our Lord and Savior. Make sure to tune in next week for the conclusion to Michael's story. Now, we love hearing from our listeners here on the Unshackled Audio Drama Podcast, so send us your questions and we'll answer them here. It can be something you're curious about or just something you want to share with us. All you have to do is write us at podcast at unshackled.org or call and leave a message at 312-281-1264. We'd love to hear from you. Now, before we get to our sweepstakes drawing info, I just want to remind you to subscribe or like our Unshackled Audio Drama Podcast. You can even share it or tell a friend. We'd also love for you to review or rate our podcast. And don't forget to check out our other podcasts on this same platform, Unshackled Daily Devotionals and Unshackled in Person. We appreciate your input and involvement in our ministry. And again, please consider supporting us so we can freely offer quality Christian programming to the world. All right, here's the prize for our new upcoming sweepstakes contest. Another beautiful wooden scripture plaque, and it is John 8, 12. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. I love that one. This is a gorgeous plaque, folks, especially if you're looking for daily inspiration from scripture. You will love this authentic and very unique wooden plaque. The plaque has been sawn from a tree branch or log and uh, cut in such a way as uh, to retain as much of the bark around the perimeter as possible. It's been handcrafted around the natural character and the beauty of the wood that, uh, well, God created. So all you have to do to enter our Unshackled Audio Drama Podcast sweepstakes drawing is call 312-281-1264 or email podcast at unshackled.org and give us your name, phone number, and email. The winner of this sweepstakes drawing for this beautiful scripture plaque will be announced November 1st, but the deadline for entry is October 20th. And next time... Michael Matthews was living carefree in the world of drugs. Dar, what is our mantra again? If you can't smoke it, swallow it, drink it, or snort it, we've got no need for it. <laughs> <laughs> After inviting an unknown associate into his inner circle. You're late. You're lucky I waited. And you'll be glad you did. His world quickly unraveled and he found himself in a jail cell. I've been lured over my life and, well, here I am in this tiny cell with nothing to show for it. When faced with the chance to cheat his way out of a long prison sentence. I've received an offer. I thought they had enough evidence they were sure of a conviction. One of the other judges approached me and said for $10,000, He'll make sure all the charges are dropped, and you'll walk away a free man. You're kidding. He'd have to decide who he really was inside. It's your get-out-of-jail-free card, and probably the only one you'll be offered. The conclusion of the true story of Michael Matthews on the next Unshackled. Heard in the true story of Michael Matthews Part 1 were Howard Friedland, Marcy Mancotti, Cheryl and Galemo, Connie Foster, Mara Kate Burns, and Michael Walner. Original music, Don Badorf. Sound effects, Michael Walner. Recording engineer and audio engineer, David Pierczynski. Script, Kylie Hammond. That's it for this week's Unshackled Audio Drama Podcast. So until next time, unless our Lord returns before then, I'm Timothy Gregory, your brother in Christ.